So to get started, I want to talk about what kinds of governance uh, have been historically observed in most societies that we've studied. Um, and this is going to be kind of a, a cross chart. We're going to look at each of these types of governances and then ask specific questions and see how they answer these questions. So the types of governances that we have are totalitarian, autocratic, charismatic, democratic, and consensus. And to give you an idea of what these are about, let's take a look at the central way they govern. Um, totalitarian government is usually a dictatorship. Uh, it is a very top-down form of government. It may have a centralized committee instead of one single person, but the uh, centralized head of state is the basic um, former of all the rules and laws that are followed underneath the dictatorship. Autocratic is sim similar except that instead of having a dictator, you have a royal or central head of state that is there due to tradition. Um, dictators are not necessarily familial, meaning that you, know, you don't pass on your dictatorship to your son or daughter, but autocratic government does. There's usually a line of secession, and that line of secession uh, is usually familial, blood-related, <coughs> with a lot of existing rules around it that, the, that people generally follow. Charismatic governance is with a central populist leader. Again, charismatic could be totalitarian, it could be autocratic. Uh, it could just be somebody who is sort of a major pain in the butt of the government. <laughs> there are uh, charismatic leaders who choose not to be inside politics, but choose to be holding those in power to, um, to the test. Uh, the thing that makes it charismatic is because the central leader is, um, is inspirational. People feel an emotional attachment to a charismatic leader that they may not feel towards an autocratic or totalitarian leader. The next is the one that we're most familiar with, and this is the idea of democracy. And for our purposes, we're only going to be talking about what is known as representative democracy, meaning that people elect leadership and that elected leadership then uh, passes legislation and uh, appoints judges to interpret laws. And uh, so they have both a bottom up and a top down kind of view to it. And then the last is consensus and in consensus, situation, uh, everybody has to agree, or at least most people have to agree upon the rules. So it's the group that is providing the leadership, not a single person or individual or group of individuals separate from the total group. A good example of consensus governance is juries. When a jury goes to deliberate on a verdict, they have to all agree for that verdict to stand. So a consensus requires unanimous vote or something close to it. <clears throat> Under totalitarian government, there's very little room for discussion. Um, basically, the rules are made and the people who are under the system follow the rules or face dire consequences. Under an autocratic system, most uh, heads of state under autocratic systems have some sort of court or group of people around them that help them make decisions. They generally have to keep the people happy to a certain extent to stay in power. And as such, uh, there is some room for discussion. If you can worm your way into um, getting the royal ear, as it were, you might be able to affect changes uh, simply by convincing the head of state that things need to change or convincing the head of state that they need to appease certain parts of their people 
in order to stay uh, in power and be successful in power. Uh, charismatic, also there's some room for discussion. Usually charismatic leaders, because they are inspirational, will, will interact with the people who follow them and will listen to the people who follow them. So it, um, it can be uh, very open. Uh, of course, some leadership, uh, especially those who end up in elected uh, or dictatorship type power arrangements may not be as open for discussion as other charismatic leaders. Uh, democracy is supposed to have a formal means for discussion. The whole purpose of having elections is that there is a accountability to the people and at least every time an election comes up, there should be some uh, means for telling the leadership what you want done and convincing the leadership that if they want to stay a part of the leadership, they should do what you're asking. And of course, consensus is based upon uh, discussion. It is imperative in a consensus situation that people discuss the issues until everybody agrees on it. So there's always room for discussion. Uh, the way that uh, totalitarian governments stay in power is usually through the threat of violence or through actual violence. Both coercive and uh, symbolic violence has a tendency to keep people um, afraid and willing to do what they're told to do for fear of reprisal. Uh, autocratic is usually based upon tradition. Uh, there are specific ways in which uh, the royal or central head of state uh, offers laws, offers policies, and there are traditional ways of petitioning that power and traditional ways of moving that power from generation to generation. Uh, charismatic leaders, um, the kind of governance they have is based upon the popularity of their movement, um, usually thought of as a social movement or a mass movement. So they uh, basically uh, usually govern with a kind of um, inspirational speeches and rallies and marches and those kinds of things. So we see, you know, People like Hitler being considered a charismatic dictator because he would hold these huge uh, rallies. And at these rallies, people would uh, um, interact with his speeches to provide um, support for him. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a frenzied sort of atmosphere. Uh, so Gandhi often had marches and would um, uh, encourage people to boycott things or to make things uh, or to just sit and refuse to obey things. So the kind of leadership that happens with charismatic leadership is usually uh, some sort of interaction with the leader, either uh, following them in what they do or responding to them in what they say. Democratic uh, power gets moved uh, peacefully for the most part in most established democracies through elections. Uh, there is an ongoing transition of power and it is set up in such a way, both in American style democracy and in parliamentary style democracy for elections to take place and um, transition of power to follow the rules, the rule of law. So. Um, consensus, the most powerful person in a consensus is an individual. And this is because if you are trying to come to a consensus and you're trying to come to unanimous votes, one person can veto uh, what is up for uh, decision. And that individual's power allows them to work to convince the other people in the room of what they want and very often is um, is the seeds for compromises among people so that one person concedes to the other on something that they don't care as passionately about 
and vice versa. So there is a lot that an individual can do under consensus, and you'll very often find that people who want to do social change strive for some sort of consensus because of that individual empowerment. So how are the rules um, disseminated under these kinds of governances? Of course, rules are a big part of uh, having a governance. They are um, the ways in which people know what to do uh, in response to this governance. Uh, totalitarian are always top-down. Um, in fact, you could look at this uh, arrangement that I have on the page is probably based mostly on how much rules are top-down versus bottom-up. So we're going on a continuum with totalitarian being the most top-down. Very often rules are made in secret, uh, in secret meetings and so forth. And uh, a lot of times people don't know that they've broken the rules until they break the rules and they're arrested or uh, punished in some way. Autocratic rules are generally top down, but of course, because there is a court and there is uh, the possibility of uh, relatives taking your power away from you, uh, there can be some bottom up to this. It's usually not that deep. In other words, um, the autocratic ruler is usually responding to the people just underneath them who have some power uh, you know, lords and barons and so forth, um, <coughs> to use European examples. Um, so, but for the most part, the, the king or queen's word is the word, unless they're in a, uh, a monarchy that is connected to a democracy. Uh, charismatic is generally top down because we have a central leader that we're very much enamored with and are interested in what they say. Uh, rules are not necessarily outlined as rules from charismatic leaders. They sometimes are outlined as uh, basically um, doing what the leader wants rather than what they have to do. Um, democracy rules are both top down and bottom up. Bottom up in the sense that we elect our officials and we put in power the people who rule over us, but they are pretty top-down otherwise because we have police forces and military and other government and courts and so forth and other government entities that regulate us and tell us what to do. Uh, so, you know, and it's a very long process to have that changed because we have to get rid of the leadership and power sometimes in order to change those rules. And consensus is always bottom up because again, you have to have that uh, unanimous agreement or near unanimous agreement in order to get anything done. So it's pretty much uh, what individuals feel and how they interact with each other from that emerges whatever rules are gonna be obeyed. And then finally, we've got to ask how stable these systems of governances are. Um, and that stability is usually dependent upon a characteristic within the governance. Uh, totalitarian stability depends on violence. And as such, it makes it a very unstable form of government. Most totalitarian governments are toppled within a few years to a few generations. It's, it's just not a very easy uh, type government to keep and that is because there's not much buy-in by the people underneath it. So you have to have more coercive uh, violence involved and, you know, and there are also other power hungry people who are just waiting to uh, take over. And so you have a lot of coups and a lot of intrigue and that kind of thing that happens with totalitarianism. So totalitarian, you know, is not, is not a very stable form of government. Autocratic, on the other hand, is extremely stable. In fact, it's kind of hard to get rid of. Um, it usually has taken, you know, look at Russia. Russia still has oligarchs, even though they got rid of their autocratic family over 100 years ago. 
and the only way that they managed to end uh, being ruled by kings or czars in this case is to wipe out the entire family of the czar in power. Uh, and even with that, they still tend towards a centralization, and there's some who are arguing that Putin is the new czar. So the stability is very strong. It, there are lots of examples of autocratic governances going on for long, long periods of time. Great Britain is another example of this. They, you know, have had a form of democracy for four or five hundred years now, but depending upon how you score it, but they still have a monarch and they have a very uh, delicate balance, delicately balanced system between autocratic and democratic rule. And they're always arguing about whether or not they should get rid of the um, get rid of the royalty. Uh, there's a movement afoot right now arguing that Queen Elizabeth ought to be the end of the line, and that they should do away with monarchy after this. But there still is a, a higher support of the monarchy, about 52 to 55 percent, versus. Um, those who don't want a monarchy anymore. And of course, the British monarchy doesn't just rule over England or Great Britain. Uh, there is a commonwealth that claim the royal family as well. So it could be very messy if they decided to, uh, to end the uh, autocratic, um, well, end the monarchy. But on the other hand, to call it an autocratic form of governance now is very, iffy, because it's more symbolic now than it is actual governance. And one probably would look at most of the Commonwealth as democratic now and not autocratic. Uh, charismatic governance depends upon the leader, and that's why most charismatic leaders get killed, um, because the easiest way to end a charismatic rule is to either kill them or discredit them. And so there is always some sort of intrigue afoot to get rid of a charismatic leader. And uh, it's very rare that charismatic leaders uh, remain in charge for long. And of course, we know that the, the uh, definition of stability from the point of view of group stability is how well it outlives the members and of course, it, killing the leader kills the movement, then it's not a very stable group uh, because uh, it doesn't outlive the, the leadership. Democratic, democratic stability rule depends upon how well people adhere to the rule of law. And that is why some democracies have come and gone because um, people who have been elected into power refuse to give up that power and refuse to obey the law, and it can uh, devolve into a totalitarian type circumstance very quickly in, if that happens. Uh, on the other hand, there are plenty of democracies that have outlived their, their citizens and their leaders and decisions that have been made. So if, uh, if the democracy continues to obey the rule of law, uh, and continues to have peaceful, ongoing transitions of power, then it can remain pretty stable. So it's, it's a fairly new type of democracy, of governance rather, especially uh, democracies that are, uh, have universal or near universal enfranchisement, meaning most of the people uh, who live there can vote. Uh, so, some of these democracies may not be as stable as we hope, uh, and time will tell. Uh, consensus is very unstable. Uh, because individuals have such power, they tend to break up very quickly. We have hung juries almost every day in the country. Uh, there are ways in which you know consensus sort of ensures that the group will not be a stable group. And this is why I've repeated in class a number of times that group stability may not be as lofty a goal as some people 
suggest because the extent to which the group is stable is the extent to which individuals lose power and the extent to which individuals have power is the extent to which groups lose stability. So um, consensus, because it is based upon individual power, is generally a fairly unstable form of governance, though not necessarily a bad form of governance. <coughs> So in thinking about these kinds of governances, you can see that certain kinds of economies work better with these governances. And you can also see that certain, uh, econ certain types of economies call for certain kinds of governances. It's a very interactive kind of thing. And so you will hear people talk about either political economies or sociologists prefer the term socio-political economies, rather than discussing the institution of, um, of governance and the, or, and the institution of economics uh, separate from each other. Um, there have been some questions in recent years as to whether or not these are as uh, deterministic as a lot of people suggest that they are. So, for example, China is a totalitarian central committee government, has been for quite a while now, um, probably about 60 or 70 years. And yet they are playing very well in free market, in so-called free market economies on the world stage. Uh, and there is some revisiting of the idea that to have a free market you have to have democracy uh, because it seems that uh, China is finding a way to create free markets uh, under a totalitarian rule. It's also kind of questioning what exactly is communism, what exactly is socialism, and what exactly is capitalism. <clears throat> so, we have to keep in mind sort of the things that help shape political economies and why they come into existence. Uh, one of the things has got to do with where they are. Um, you know, it's much easier to build certain kinds of political economies depending upon the geography. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Resources, not just natural resources, but also historic resources and uh, the talents of the particular people who are involved, the cultural resources that exist, uh, belief systems, attitudes, except, et cetera, and practices, all kind of shape society and help create unique cultures. You remember in our last um, <coughs> uh, module, we talked about um, social institutions as being a series of questions that have to be answered. And these questions are answered in multiple ways. So they help create, you know, huge variations among cultures. And those answers to those questions are shaped by these things like geography and history and uh, cultural practices. And of course, you know, historic events uh, have uh, a lot to do with why a certain political economy exists in a certain place at a certain time. Um, and this, of course, also has to do with technology. Technological advancement is easier to do in some areas where there are resources and harder to do in, un in some areas where resources are more scarce. And finally, we're about ready to give you a list of um, different political economies. And this list that I'm about to give you is going to be in a particular order, and that order is historic, meaning that if we're looking at Western uh, socio-political economies, they have moved through these different political economies to get to where we are today and where we're going tomorrow. Oftentimes, this gets discussed as if it is predetermined or linear. That is, if you are a hunter-gatherer, eventually what you will start doing is planting things, 
and then become agrarian. And if you become agrarian, then you'll start having division of labor and therefore you'll become, you know, more feudal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I mean, Star Trek uh, is the worst at this with their classification of planets being in particular stages of, um, of evolution. I don't want you to get the idea that what I'm describing is an evolutionary process. It just happens to be the history of Western economies, Western political economies. So keep that in mind. Don't see this as one thing has to lead to another. And I will talk more detailed as we go along about some of these things still existing today, even though we think of them as our past. So let's talk about the first kind of political economy. This used to be a dominant form of political economy uh, among human beings. Uh, and up until about 10,000 years ago, one might argue it was the only form of human political economy, and that is hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers occur, societies occur in places where there is food. Uh, so if you have forests where you can uh, hunt and forage uh, for food, then that's a good place. And then plains also where there are vast fields of grass and different kinds of animals that feed off of those grasses. Uh, you are not going to find hunter-gatherer societies in a desert. There's just not a lot of stuff here to, uh, to, to gather up or to hunt to keep a group of people uh, away from starvation. And generally, it's a hunter-gatherer political economy. Uh, anthropologists will tell you if you're about three days out from starvation. So at any given moment, the uh, group of people do not have enough food to last more than a few days. So they've got to start thinking about where they're going to have food again. <clears throat> so of course, what they're going to do is follow where the food is. And seasonal variations and over hunting an area or over picking an area uh, might lead them to go to other places. So basically, uh, most hunter-gatherer societies are very nomadic, meaning that they wander around chasing the climate, chasing the food, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so if there's a drought in an area, or if there is uh, a lack of food in an area, then they most likely are going to move somewhere else. And this means that they don't carry a lot on them because they need to be able to move quickly. So housing structures, clothing, um, gathering of po possessions are very minimal and also that they can move from place to place. <clears throat> so the biggest event that ended this political economy was the agricultural revolution that occurred somewhere between uh, nine and 10,000 uh, BCE. And <clears throat> this happened in an area that's called the Fertile Crescent. Uh, this area is fairly deserty now. We're talking about the Middle East, uh, places like Iran and Turkey. And uh, the reason that they're deserty is because early agricultural attempts uh, pretty much took all the nutrients out of the soil. So you have climate change, and you have humans affecting climate change in that area over thousands of years. But this is definitely you know, where humans first stopped running around trying to find food and started actually creating food, either through having animals that they kept. There were some uh, nomadic parts to that when they started uh, um, taking animals and, and um, rearing them in, for food, and then also planting food. So um, you have a little bit of variation on this, but basically when, um, when animals started being domesticated and food started being uh, harvested, you had a major change 
in the way that power occurred. You had a major change in the way that people uh, interacted with each other. <clears throat> Most of the time before the agricultural revolution or in current hunter-gatherer societies, and some still exist today, uh, you have a form of governance that has been called tribal. And what this means is that either everybody, it's, it's pretty much consensus-based in the sense that most people are a small group of people um, who rise to be in that group either because of their competency in hunting and gathering or because they are of a certain age. Um, usually come together and interact with each other to make decisions. Of course, decisions are not that complex in this situation either because most of the decisions are centered around, um, around uh, food as well, like where are we going to go, who's going to hunt, who's going to gather, who's going to prep, that kind of thing. But tribal is definitely um, the form of governance that most hunter-gatherer societies had and still have today. All right, so we mentioned the agricultural revolution. What this led to is a political economy that we'll call agrarian. Sometimes it's also called peasant economies. Um, we'll talk about why peasants in a minute. Okay, so the place for this obviously is places that you can grow food or that animals can graze and, and or I should say because uh, some did both, some did one or the other. So if you can imagine a map right now, the agrarian political economy essentially was uh, spread across uh, the more moderate temperatures uh, that have four seasons. So not too far north, not too far south, and not very much in the southern hemisphere because if you look at a globe, the southern hemisphere has got more water than it does land. And so the, and the land tends to be closer to the equator or closer to cold uh, climes than it does in this kind of moderate four season climb. So we have a tendency nowadays to call these small towns that kind of work with the season as, and have mostly farming and agriculture, we would call them rural. And we still, of course, have rural areas that are mostly farms and so forth and uh, ar around the world. But um, for the most part, most people live in cities. Most people do not live in rural areas nowadays. And this was a fairly dominant way that people lived for a long period of time. Uh, you, even if you look at some place that is considered civilized, like you know a civilization like Egypt, it was basically an agrarian economy. It had a, a lot of wealth from that, and as such, it began to differentiate into uh, a more hierarchical system than a, agrarian economies would suggest. But it still was basically centered around the Nile, centered around the food that could be generated and the seasons that helped generate that food. <clears throat> and, you know, I've mentioned seasons several times. Seasons become very important at this point. Now, seasons were important to hunter-gatherers because seasonal changes meant you needed to go somewhere. But seasons are a little different under the agrarian political economy because now you have to do things locally to prepare for these changes in season. And this includes things like when you plant, uh, how do you facilitate and care for the crops while they're growing or the animals while they're growing, and also how to harvest or slaughter uh, animals uh, when the time comes. Uh, and of course, most of these places have some form of winter, and winter is a time when you know you, you needed to have planned to store up food because it's very rare that you can have big grazing lands or big uh, planting during the winter time. So the winter season is based upon how good you were 
at, uh, at storing your meat and your grain in order to make it through the winter. And then, of course, the other thing that becomes very important now is land. Uh, most hunter-gatherer societies do not think of land as something that you own. And most agrarian societies start uh, looking at land ownership as being an important part of, uh, of their economy. And with land comes a couple of things. One is mathematics, because you have to be able to figure out where the borders are. And also, you have a hierarchy between landowners and people who do not own land. And you also have inheritance. You have people who want to make sure that when they die, their family receives that land and nobody else does. So you start having some power tensions at this point. So ownership is very important, and it's in you'll see that most hunter-gatherer societies, ownership is not a concept that's thought about much. But with agrarian societies, we start thinking about who owns what, who owns the storage, who owns the animals, who owns the plants, who owns the land, and so forth. And you have the beginning of a hierarchy because you have division of labor um, because you do not have everybody having to be in the, in the job of creating food the way you do in a hunter-gatherer society. So you start having status. You start having different uh, levels of power. It's not, I think, unusual that you also start having monotheistic religions. Uh, monotheistic religions mean the belief in one God over all or one God who is God of the gods. And if you look at most agrarian societies that develop into civilizations that have religious uh, beliefs, most of these religious beliefs center around either a, uh, a single uh, monotheistic uh, being that is overseen, uh, overseeing everything, and from that monotheistic being, those who lead us have their power, or you have a panacea of gods, but there is one god who is over all the other gods. Um, see, we have ownership in this idea of land coming into, and this idea of rank, you know, status. So it seems to be reflected in the belief systems of the people as well. And very often the deity are the, is the one or are the ones who um, give validity to the owners who own things. Probably legitimacy instead of validity would be a better word. Um, <clears throat> so the term to know here is feudalism. Feudalism is a system of ranking. Feudalism uh, has occurred uh, throughout Europe, throughout Asia, uh, a small amount throughout Africa, and a small amount in uh, North and South America. Um, basically, feudalism is a system whereby those who own the land are essentially the rulers of the people who live on the land. Uh, there's usually a class after a class of owners there is a class that I would call the security class. These are the people who defend the borders and help keep um, the, uh, the people who are um, underneath the owner in, uh, keep them contained and make sure that they don't try to steal stuff or take stuff, you know, that they obey the rules. And then you have a class of artisans these are the people who create the tools for, uh, for tilling the land, for taking care of animals, and so forth. These are skilled laborers. And then underneath that are the peasants, sometimes called um, um, the serfs. There are other words for them as well. But these are basically the people who work the land. And they are, and in fact, you can see that the closer you get to working that land, the lower your status is in a feudal society. 
Um, and these categories are the structure of the uh, political economy and, and, and they determine normative behavior, they determine um, uh, things like who you marry, uh, how many kids you have, what you do every day of your life, all of those kind of things are determined by which class you are born into. Uh, of course, there are some uh, feudal uh, systems that have got more classes than the four that I've outlined, um, but there are not any, I think, that have fewer than those four classes. Those classes are kind of necessary to keep the uh, system going. So, <clears throat> um, so you may be wondering how do we move from feudal Europe to what we have today? And this went through some changes, especially after say 1400 or so that kind of led up to the industrial revolution. Um, I call it cottage capitalism, but there are uh, other people who have uh, other terms for it, but it's basically um, bringing us to a political economy that is based upon individual ownership of businesses and farms rather than the feudal uh, system. So how did we get there? Well, for one thing, we started building cities. So um, basically, as we began to become more enlightened, began to believe in a central uh, church, the Catholic Church being the ruler of Europe, uh, began to explore the world. All of these kind of things were going on in the 1400s and 1500s. Um, we began to build cities. And cities meant that people had a concentrated area where they needed goods and services. And there were people who, um, as feudal uh, city-states broke up, you had people who were formerly artisans who began to create guilds and create businesses based upon those skills. And you had laborers who no longer were working the fields who came to the city looking for ways to work. And some of the things that helped with uh, the changes in this is that because you have um, a city, you have what are called local markets. That means that people start trying to figure out how to exchange good and, goods and services. You know, under a feudal system, you really didn't have an exchange system per se because it was so top down. Now you have less of a top down, so people have to figure out how to barter with each other how to exchange things. We have the rise of banking during this time. Um, banking is an important aspect of this because, and, and it's interesting because you can see how things change because of the unexpected consequences of certain things that uh, people decide to do. A good example is the rise of banking. Basically, you have the Catholic Church that was concerned by the fact that the Muslim empire uh, was expanding. It had expanded into parts of Italy and into Spain and had taken over much of what we think of as the Holy Land in uh, European societies. And as such, the popes began to draw from the security classes of their feudal lords, uh, usually knights, right? and asked that they send these people to fight crusades against the Muslims. And these crusades uh, essentially gave people who had never been past a two-mile square area in their entire lives a chance to see the world and see other cultures and a chance to enrich themselves because in most of the time these armies were paid for uh, by looting, by allowing when they took over a town or won a battle to take the wealth out of that town. Um, and, uh, and they brought a lot of stuff back home. And then they get called out on another campaign uh, 
and they've got to figure out how to take care of the stuff back home so that it will not become um, become uh, looted while they're gone. So this is how early banking worked. It provided a place where you could put your particular stuff in safekeeping. Um, <clears throat> And of course, you know, this happened under feudalism to a certain extent too, but in banking under feudalism was generally among the elite class. What you now have is banking from this kind of mobile uh, class that's coming and going into the, into, away from the land and back to it. And of course they brought knowledge and they brought other practices, other cultures, and it became revolutionary. So in this weird way, the Catholic Church trying to keep a hold of its power in fear of the, uh, the Muslim other ended up losing its power because of the ways in which the unexpected consequences of having a class of people seeing you know, other parts of the world and gaining some upward mobility and some wealth of their own. So by the 14-1500s, you have people who have, uh, start thinking it is possible for me to die in a class different from the one I was born into, higher than the one I was born into. And so this is the source, you know, this is what cities, why cities grew. They grew with people looking for their fortunes. And this is also how we got the so-called new world because a number of people who came to our hemisphere, to the Western Hemisphere, from Europe came here seeking wealth, seeking a chance uh, to move up in the world uh, from their uh, traditional uh, class in Europe. And so I mentioned the Crusades and banking as being a major part of this. Uh, change, a major part of this upward mobility. I will mention one more thing about banking, and that is that uh, we start seeing the rise of currency during this time. Most of the time in the past, uh, banking was a, um, banking was a, uh, a matter of coinage and, you know, raw materials. But banks began to give certificates out uh, in, uh, in the form of notes uh, at the value of the material that you put into the bank, and that's where currency began. You also see a number of people who uh, begin to find ways around being uh, financed by the rulers of the, and, and as such, they begin to self-finance some of what they did. So this idea of mercantilism is kind of a, um, a transitional period from feudalism to capitalism. Mercantilism at first was the way in which uh, royalty began to expand, uh, you know, feudal lords began to expand their wealth was to finance expeditions first to India and China and places like that, uh, and then also with the advent of um, Christopher Columbus, who, by the way, had backing from one of these feudal lords, uh, Isabella and Ferdinand, king and queen of Spain, so that backwards queen and king of Spain, provided the financing for Columbus to go off and find a Western route to uh, to China or to India. And this was a mercantile ship. It was a mercantile ship because all of the provisions for the ship were paid for via uh, Isabella and Ferdinand. And then they also uh, turned to a bank for financing and financed this in part with a loan from uh, the Medici. So Columbus goes, he discovers this new land, and this starts, this opens the floodgates for European countries to head west looking for more money. And, look, and at first, this was for uh, 
uh, for the feudal lords of Europe, for the royalty of Europe. They were the ones who were financing this. They were the ones who were uh, uh, giving legitimacy to these expeditions. But what you see uh, in the 15 and 1600s is the rise of stock markets. And what this is, is self-funding by investors instead of turning to leadership to fund these things. They, uh, things like the Dutch India Trading Company um, started looking to people who have gotten rich from earlier uh, expeditions, putting money into new expeditions so that they could increase their wealth. And so you have the first stock market in which people actually, you know, were, they invested in one of these um, expeditions and they were given a stock, a piece of paper uh, saying to them, your investment is worth so much money. And then, you know, most of these expeditions took years to come and go. So if you needed the money that you put into it um, and the anticipated wealth that you are going to receive, you basically could trade money for that stock in order to, uh, to get your profit now rather than waiting until the expedition came back. And when that happened, people began to um, began to uh, have exchanges, places. They used to, you know, it started out kind of in the back of a pub somewhere, but it eventually became what we think of as the stock market today. So, <clears throat> uh, so mercantilism slowly moved its way into. Um, corporations and into stock markets. Um, it's important to understand this because mercantilism and this idea of the stock market is not what you would call free market economy. It's still a very top-down kind of thing. Uh, and that's why most corporations today still need to have some sort of legitimacy from a government, a license or something like that, in order to be in existence because these traditions of how corporations worked and how stock markets worked were set up not in a period of industrialization and not in a period of free markets, but in a period that was very close to feudalism and it has some of the characteristics of feudalism still showing up in the way that we do this business today. So that brings us to the, industri the Industrial Revolution and industrialization. Now, one could argue that industrialization sort of started in the 1600s with the uh, invention of the spinning jenny, um, but basically most industrialization occurred in the late uh, 18th century and in the 19th century. The place that we associate with industrialization, believe it or not, is the suburb. And the reason for this is that you now could live away from where you worked. As you, industrialization is about mass production. It's about producing more than you can sell locally. So this mass production was done in a central location and this central location had to have factory workers and these factory workers did not have to live uh, in the factory. See, before this, in cottage capitalism, people lived where they worked. You either lived on the farm, if you were a farmer, or you lived near the small family business if you were in the city. But we now have the ability to move away from where we work, and you see suburbs uh, beginning to grow throughout the 19th and 20th century in part because of the industrialization of most of Western Europe and the United States and Canada. <clears throat> so there's several events that are important in understanding industrialization. And I'm going to go over these individually instead of all together. The first is that towards the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, you have 
uh, the invention of the assembly line. So a lot of people think that Henry Ford invented the car. He did not. What he invented was a way to build the car. And that required specialization. And essentially an assembly line is repetitive work done over and over again. So it's done really well, kind of mindlessly. And it just does a little part of the end product. So up until an assembly line, most things were manufactured from start to finish by a single person or a small group of single people were, you know, acting and doing everything that was needed in order to build the thing. With an assembly line, you have a large group of people, each of which have a small part in the final product, but nobody seeing the final product from the beginning to the, from the beginning of uh, collecting the resources all the way to the end of creating the product. Assembly lines are everywhere now. It revolutionized the way that we think about the world around us. We do a lot of things via assembly line that we don't even think about. Like you go see a movie at a Cineplex that has nine movie theaters, or, and you go into the ticket, you get in the line for tickets, and then you move to the line for refreshments, and then you move to the theater, and then from the theater, you move to the bathroom, and then you go out a different door than you came in. Your experience is encountering people along the way who do just one thing to ensure that you get to see the movie, right? One little part of your experience is provided by a group of people who do not provide the entire experience. Cineplexes are assembly lines. Education is assembly line. You go to your sociology class, your sociology teacher teaches you nothing but sociology, and then they sort of, you know, open your head up, pour in knowledge, put your head back down, and they send you off to history class, and in history class, and you do, you know, the history teacher does the same thing. So if you were to look at, from afar, the way people are moving in a high school or in a college, you would see, in fact, a kind of assembly line going on, where education used to be a kind of, uh, especially college education, used to be a kind of mentorship in which you would work with one professor during the entire time of your education who would then, you know, suggest different experiences, books to read, lectures to attend, that kind of thing, in order to create a, uh, a good education for you, we now have this kind of assembly line mentality in the way that we do things. So I promise you now that you know about assembly lines, you will be seeing them everywhere because they are everywhere. We, we consider this in our culture an efficient way to do things. And as such, a lot of businesses see this as uh, the best way to set up their business. And of course, in the last module, we talked about how this machine thinking has led to machines actually doing our work. And most true assembly lines that is assembling something for manufacturing nowadays are machine driven, not human driven. So this has some implications for the way we do things in the future. We talked about suburbs becoming possible because of industrialization. One of the major milestones in this is the creation of Fannie Mae in 1938. And the story goes like this. Nelson Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller, sorry, I can't remember the father's name. Anyway, um, he goes, Rockefeller goes to the um, Department of Commerce, the head of the Department of Commerce, and says, this is in the middle of the Great Depression, and says, I'm really worried that we are going to have a whole bunch of people, a bunch of workers who are going to have a communist revolution. Remember, this is just 20 years from when Russia saw its Bolshevik revolution. So what can we do to prevent this? And so it was decided that basically, if we could convince people that they had private ownership of their homes, they would not want to become communists because the government would take over ownership of their homes. 
And to facilitate this, they created Fannie Mae, which essentially guaranteed a 30-year mortgage to the banks because a 30-year mortgage is not a good investment. It's not a good investment for the individual who's taking the mortgage because that individual is going to pay probably about three times what their property is worth. Their property is not going to go up in value over that 30-year period to the point where they're going to get the interest back that they're paying on the home. And there are a lot of people in 2008 with the big crash who figured out the truth of this, that they don't actually own their, their property. Banks own their property. But the other part of this is that it's not a good bet on the bank's part because the bank is betting that you're going to be able to have a steady job with a steady income without any interruption through sickness or children or any of these other things for 30 years. That just doesn't happen. Before this, most people took out mortgages for only about four or five years, and they took out mortgages on assets that produced money. So their business, their farm, that kind of thing. So just buying a house that you're going to live in and paying for it over a 30-year period is really a bad financial bet on both sides. But because of Fannie Mae, it becomes a good bet because through Fannie Mae, you're owning a house was cheaper than renting a house. That used to be true. It's not as true as it was. But when Fannie Mae was created, mortgage payments were less than rental payments. Um, and also Fannie Mae had, you know, there is this great cultural campaign of this sort of American dream of ownership. Now, you see the date on this, 1938. This is pretty late in the Depression and pretty early in what became World War II. Um, so you don't really have a lot of people taking advantage of Fannie Mae until post-World War II. And at that point, you have the GI Bill. So the GI Bill helped keep, help make a down payment for these 30-year mortgages. The GI Bill gave uh, returning soldiers a chance to go to college and to have a higher paying job or what was became coined, the term became coined a white collar job um, through uh, studying professional knowledge rather than technical or um, skilled knowledge. So you have a lot of people who become executives, who become attorneys, who become law, uh, who become uh, medical people, that kind of thing. And so after, and with a no down payment on a house, uh, you know, that down payment being financed by the GI Bill, you start having people sort of taking a hold of this American dream of household or, ho or home ownership. <clears throat> this has some very profound effects on family life, on cities, on um, workplaces, and so forth. One of the things that it did is it reinforced and actually made more uh, solid the idea that a woman's place was in the home. Now, <clears throat> it must be understood that before World War II, only higher middle class women and upper class women thought of themselves as the head of their domestic domains and that their husbands were um, in charge of the work domain. Most people lived in extended families and had family businesses or family farms. And women worked at these just as often as men did. And in fact, women were the ones who first went into the factories because they would supplement the income of their families by um, providing that uh, extra income from the factory. But by mid 20th century, this, uh, this had all shifted around. And what you have in the 1950s is the right, late 40s and early 1950s as these men got out of college through the GI Bill, you have them moving to suburbs. And what you have then 
is a company called Levittown, the Levitt Brothers, who create these kind of cookie cutter suburbs that we have now. So what they did, the first one that they did was on Long Island. This was three or four floor plans for the housing. These were, you put certain, certain money down, you get a finance through Fannie Mae, you, or the GI Bill puts down money for you. You create this single family house dwelling in which parents and children lived, mother stayed home, father went to work, uh, you had neighborhood schools, and you had this whole sort of separation of work and family that occurred and these very strict gender roles. Now, a lot of people think that we have always had nuclear families as the dominant family system, that we have always had women working in the home and not working outside the home as the dominant um, idea of work, and this is just simply not true. Only with these events, the Fannie Mae, GI Bill, and Levittown, do we have the beginning, this this myth of the American dream and this as being home ownership and this myth of the nuclear family being the basic family unit. Um, <clears throat> so you can see how industrialization changes quite a few things. It changes the way that cities are composed, uh, where work is in the city, but life living is outside the city if you're in the middle class. It changes the way women and men uh, interact with each other. It changes the way we spend money. It changes the way we invest money. It changes the way that we live our lives in our workplaces. Uh, before this, if you were a lawyer, an accountant, or uh, some sort of um, uh, business person, you probably went into business for yourself. After this, after the GI Bill, you have so many college graduates, what you have is the emergence of uh, offices where people go and work for a large company. You have a corporate version of these professions. Um, C. Wright Mills coined the term white collar. And what this is talking about is a group of workers who have intellectual jobs rather than jobs that they do with their hands. It also gives us the term blue collar blue collar being those skilled jobs that you do with your hands. So we also have during this time, because you can see that a lot of this was in reaction to socialism. So the terms that you want to think about are socialism, communism, and oligopoly. Socialism and communism we need to distinguish in sociology. Socialism is referring to a kind of economy in which goods and services are distributed on the basis of need rather than the basis of income or what you can spend money on. We have socialism in the United States. It's called a library. It's called a fire department. There are lots of ways in which some goods and services are distributed on the basis of when we need it, not on the basis of whether we can afford it. Communism is a, uh, is a, so a political economy that made the government the centralized um, overseer of distributing those goods and services on the basis of need. And of course, because it became very totalitarian, very centralized, there were a lot of problems that came up with communism. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, it became very difficult to stabilize and sustain because it required so much in the way of of um, oversight and violence in order to keep it together. Um, <clears throat> but that's not to let capitalism off the hook here, because what happens in industrialization is that there are a few players in each industry who, who do it w better than everybody else, who amass wealth beyond everybody else, and they begin to uh, sort of buy up their competitors and you have monopolies and oligopolies. And these are hurtful to, um, to what was thought of as capitalism, which was supposed to be a free market of exchange where you had a lot of competitors. So industrialization, while it gets connected to capitalism quite a lot, many sociologists argue 
that it was also the kind of end of capitalism because it created this rise of oligopolies. So what's the future? Where are we going now? Well, a lot of people are arguing that, especially in Europe and in the United States and Canada, we live in a post-industrialized world. We live in a world of cyberspace. Now the place is not you know, so much connected to geography. It's you know, because you can interact and have um, economies that are dependent upon each other globally, and you can interact and communicate uh, through cyberspace and through the web and in virtual ways rather than just um, uh, through mass production and through uh, industrialization. The resources for this global world is electronics, energy, the grid. What becomes the most important resource is whether or not you have the energy to keep electric, you know, to keep your batteries charged, to keep the electricity flowing. Because electronics require that energy. And that's why as the post-industrialized world has emerged, you have more and more emphasis on how we get energy. You have this in the industrialized world to a certain extent, uh, but as in the, in the industrialized world for a while, invention created the possibility of um, more efficient use of energy. But now we use energy not to invent things, but to actually live our lives to work. And so we are uh, basically beginning to run out of some of the, in the uh, energy that we started using uh, in the industrialized period. And it's creating the possibility of a lot of problems. Some of the events that we're looking at here in, is first of all, the information highway. The fact that we now, you know, the currency of today is more information than it is actual physical things that we can hold. When banks, um, in the feudal age and in the um, uh, capitalistic age um, had money that was flowing back and forth. That money had gold behind it. That money had stuff behind it. Now that money is just basically uh, binary uh, ones and zeros, right? It, I mean, your wealth is more electronic than it is physical. Even when you're talking about currency, that currency is, um, is not as not representative of all your health, all your wealth. Most people, if they of all of their wealth is in what they can carry in their pocket in the way of currency, um, then they probably are not very rich. The wealthier you get, the more your wealth is expressed in information rather than expressed in, uh, in goods that you hold. And we can see this in the fact that people now sell money. There are people whose jobs consist of looking at exchanges between different currencies and buying you know, yens in the morning and selling them for euros in the afternoon and seeing a profit by playing the money markets. This adds nothing to productivity. It adds nothing in the way of real, you know, product to our lives. It is just essentially this kind of um, uh, wealth by symbology, right? Money is symbolic. The ones and zeros are symbolic. And people still consider this a, a productive activity when in fact it is producing essentially nothing. And in fact, there are some people who argue that the wealth that we have created uh, in the latter half of the 20th century and the 21st century isn't real wealth at all. That is just, um, it's just as good as, you know, the, the electronics that keep it there. And as such, it's, um, it, it, it's, a lot of people are predicting that it eventually collapse and uh, because it is so not connected to what we eat, to what we put over our heads, 
you know, to our everyday lives. Um, and that's in part why we have to keep buying things up in order to feel like we're wealthy. And uh, because we don't have a lot of stuff that creates this wealth. And then ironically, we also have a world that creates scarcity. So, you know, basic economics is that the scarcer something is, the more you can charge for it. So because this is more information-based than it is material-based, you have a whole bunch of people who create false scarcities. Disney is the best example I can think of of this. You know, they can reproduce Cinderella onto a DVD or streaming, you know, for trillions of times, far more than there are people on Earth, far more than there will be people on Earth. So to tell you that Cinderella is only available for a limited time, and this happens about every three years so that the new three-year-olds can, you know, who have no memory of this happening three years ago can complain and uh, petition their parents to get Cinderella because it's going to go away soon. Um, so, you know, this is a false scarcity and this happens quite often in our economy in the post-industrialized world because we in fact have plenty and, and we have so much that in order to feel like we're wealthy, we're having to make stuff up. And, and we do not have a lot of scarcity in developed economies. So the fear is that you can't make a lot of profit unless you create this scarcity. And this, of course, could also makes us on shakier and shakier ground. Some terms you want to think about, consumerism. Uh, we live in a time where the health of our economy is not measured by how much we've saved, by how much we produce, but rather by how much we have spent, how much stuff, how much goods, how much services we have consumed. And there are a lot of people who argue that consumerism is not only bad for our economy, but it's bad for our culture as well that uh, consumeristic uh, ideas about what is worthwhile, what is valued, is shaping our attitudes into much more um, selfish ways. Technopoly is a concept that you should know about. Technopoly was a book that was written by uh, a man named Neil Postman. Um, he is essentially arguing in this book that the way that we think about technology uh, shapes our culture. And he argues that we now live in a technopoly. And the major um, value that we have is that if we can create it, if we can create a technology, then we must use it. So he points out a few examples in the book one is MRI machines. MRI machines are a very wonderful advanced technology. It helps people find tumors and other kinds of things sooner than we ever would before. It is uh, helping with brain surgery and, uh, and understanding our brain. It's helping with research in ways that hasn't before. But there are places where there are too many, because we have a for-profit medical system, too many MRI machines for the, pops, for the surrounding population. Uh, Gainesville, Florida is a good example of this, where I lived for a while when I went to school. In Gainesville, Florida, when school is in session, there's about 150,000 people in the town. It's a very small town. If uh, in the summertime, that population goes down closer to 80,000, because students have gone home, uh, and they had eight MRI machines in town, and nobody was making a profit at using their MRI machine because uh, they had too many machines per capita. Uh, so what did they start doing? They started encouraging doctors to send people to MRIs for things that a simple X-ray or other kinds of de detect detection would work. Um, and so this is a perfect example of what Postman is talking about because he's saying because the eight MRI machines existed, they were there, they had been built, 
the the uh, doctors were pushed to use them more often. And this happens quite a bit. And this can be very scary because if you think about the uh, the uh, military industrial complex, it is a very high technology. We have all kinds of war to toys now that are high tech war toys. And we are living in like the 16th year, the 17th year of, um, of the war in Afghanistan in part because there is this you know, desire once we've created these war toys to then create war. And there are many who argue that we are in perpetual war now because we have these technologies. So the question is, do we build technology in order to make our lives better and to, in order to get the things that we value or is our technology making us value things and want things? Going green is another aspect of this. Of course, if we're talking about energy being the main resource, then you have a lot of people who are now claiming that their businesses are green businesses. And this creates a, um, a lot of questions about whether or not um, um, whether or not something is truly green. You, he, you hear a lot of arguments one way or the other. Uh, an example of this and why this is so difficult is um, fast food restaurants. So there are many who would argue that we would be utilizing our energy resources much better if we were to do away with paper altogether. And if you went to a fast food restaurant, they gave you a plate and, uh, and utensils to eat your meal. Uh, the problem with this is that once that is done, it has to be washed and uh, wash in, in a, a dishwasher and dried out and so forth with heat in order to uh, ensure that germs are killed and all that kind of stuff. And so there have been people who have pointed out that if we use recycled material to create the paper waste that is created from fast foods, that we actually are using less resources than we would if we reused the utensils and the plates and the packaging for these fast foods. So it looks like you're going green when you're not utilizing a lot of paper, but in truth, uh, you would be going green less uh, by utilizing some kinds of paper than you would if you were demanding that places washed their dishes on a regular basis. So <clears throat> where we're going in the future is um, in this post-industrial age is difficult to predict. We certainly are in a time of transition in our political economy. Um, we have forces that are trying to centralize us and forces that are trying to decentralize us. And one would argue that you know, soci sociological knowledge is going to be very helpful as we go through these big transitions. 